um, we're talking about a very interesting but very difficult to understand topic. And the topic is called Web 3.0 and blockchain. For me, someone who started a career in Web 1.0 or even pre-Web 1.0, this seems to be a natural transition. But I know it's really complicated for everybody, especially now with the impetus we have to all of us be part of that Web 3.0 blockchain. Most of us think of blockchain and think of cryptocurrency, but that's not what blockchain is only about. That is one of its stronger features and the one that actually gave it financial glory. But let's start by doing a simple understanding of where was Web 1.0 and how are we going into Web 3.0 and what are the differentiators? So to do this, I'm going to ask Yash to actually put up the presentation. It's just a three screen presentation. This one is specially created for cultural and experience creators, people who are educators, people who are entertainers. This is for you all to simplify what tech tomorrow is going to look at. I know words like AI, AR, VR, all are very complicated. This is just de-simplifying it, demystifying it for you. So we are actually, the cultural, the creative community is actually called the thermostats of the community because we are the pre-thinkers. Or I, who co conveniently think of oneself as a creator, we think we are the knowledge and expression that are created from the roots. We give it visuals, verbal, education, knowledge. It is about how our communities we perceive, interpret, internalize, and reflect, and respond to the social realities around us. So you will notice that when we were we will be the first to be touched by technology, the first to have a million ideas and always be innovative and things evolve around us. Now, cultural diffusion via technology has been consistent ever since cultural shifts. Changing civilizations have pushed forward the need of innovation. So it's almost normal where people say, oh, culture and arts and creator and technology don't work together. I say that's not true. I feel that arts, culture, crafts, entertainment, tourism, and hospitality are the gatekeepers of new technology. We are the adopters and we actually take it forward for people to do mass adoption. Now, the reason I will tell you is, is how I've been through this. So I come from the web 1.0 technology where I created the first platform for e-commerce, luxury e-commerce and design online. And this was in 2000. This was the time when the internet technology was propelling globalization. It was giving a platform for people like me from Dhaka to Denmark to meet, to exchange ideas, to put up thoughts. But it was a plain format. It was just a vanilla pla platform. Now, global culture was actually being dispensed, and global was the name born. But also came companies like Make My Trip, Amazon, my own company, a style statement, Yatra, and eBay. These companies actually made a connect between consumers and people and it was the beginning of something where you had a new form of distribution. That's all it was, a new avenue for distribution and a way to go beyond your own boundaries. That's also when you saw Asia giving out some of the best designers, the best artists, the best singers. This was the time that nobody had known that Asia had all that. So it was a time of awareness. Web 2.0 was the end, end of uh, was the era of commoditization. This was when everybody said, Cello, let's let's start making some money on this. It's all nice to have a lot of cultural exchange. If anybody is my age, they'll remember IRC. But now it became about cultural exponents and consumers intermingling and creating an energy of their own and an energy exchange, sometimes through money and sometimes through um say collaborations. Now this energized culturalist or creator or entertainer educator started influencing their audience, their mindset and perceptions, and this changed them forever. Suddenly, the Insta influencers, the Facebook mavericks, the big influencers economy was born. Now, it is also birthed an other economy, which is really important for artists, craftspeople, for people like in the travel trade or people who are into entertainment and um, education. The, there, were, there were curators that were born. In education, you saw Corsia. In um, in uh, sales, you saw online sales. Christie's, even a, an old company like Christie's, an ancient relic with a lot of great heritage, was actually going online. And they were taking, and they were became the curators online. Now it opened up to more people. More people had were becoming um, interacting. They were not seen as storekeepers. They were seen as 
curators. It was these galleries that went online. They were able to influence culture online and turn it into a commodity and create sales. This was actually uh, beyond awareness, giving access. Okay. Now comes Web 3.0. So what's so different about Web 3.0 between Web 2.0 and Web 3.0? Web 3.0, we keep hear, we're hearing words like blockchain, DAO, NIFT, uh, cryptocurrency. But this, I feel, is actually important for culture creators, educators, and um, even entertainers. And we're seeing this. We're seeing this play out. This innovative technology translates very well because it conveys and bridges a sentiment and creates where the culture is passion is unlocked and can immersively reach the people. Now, let me explain that. Basically, Web 3.0 is nothing but an evolution of Web 3.0. It's an add-on of technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, blockchain, which actually are now making all the communication more personalized and more interactive and definitely more immersive. So things like VR glasses, AI uh, information, these are things which are now seamlessly being good. So today, if you go to Facebook and you log in and you put up a picture, it asks you, do you want a 360 version? That's VR for you. So this is now seamlessly good. If you go online and you see one day you've checked a, a beautiful handbag or you've gone and seen a course on course here, the next day the system will bombard you with information on the very same. And guess what? It's because of AI and machine learning. But what does it do for people like you and me? What does it do for everyday labor? And what, how does it power social change? One, it builds direct awareness for your culture, your creativity, your talent, your experience, whatever you are about to offer. It is a social platform, a person to person platform. It's removing the gatekeepers, the middlemen, the galleries, the curators. It's making the person the curator. It's when you put something on a blockchain, as Mandar and Gora will explain to you, you actually create an intellectual copyright of your own. It is a certification of what you are doing. So nobody can, not even a machine can cut or place. It is creating tribes, you know, new creators, your new customers who are actually acting as your voice. It is democratizing access and remove, like I mentioned, removing the middlemen. Most important, it is a digitization of culture, of education, of everything and the monetization models come into play and it's direct you do not need to have big systems to do what this can do it's person to person and you're seeing that a simple thing like instagram say but now you're going into a more say for your for example you want to buy travel someone wants to buy travel but they also want to see your feedback they also want to get your um a number so that they can make a payment. They also want to know how reputable you are and what are the things you, you, you can show. So maybe VR, AI, and video will create that information for them in the preliminary, where they stir awareness for your, for your opportunity. Then they take it to the, and automatically they personalize the needs of the client. They take them to another, another spot where they actually tell them, okay, this is how much it will cost. These are the transparent costs. You can book the hotel, you can book me, you can book the wellness operator directly. Oh, okay, so I want to know how other people have liked it. Well, on the same block, you have that information. And even as the person trans, uh, uh, travels, you can remain connected to the person through simple tools, through location-based information, through uh, ma very many other such um, tools that Web 3.0 affords us. So let, rounding this up before we go into, um, um, into the whole blockchain session is how are we going to take ownership of our assets how are we going to make our assets trackable and traceable how what are the opportunities for engagement and education what is what about it is about fragmentation of ownership what is digital democracy in terms of ownership and the metaverse just a touch of the metaverse and how you can use the web 3.0 for storytelling for subscriptions for merchandising models and for the many more on this note, I leave you to take over. I leave you to take over Mandar. Um, just a brief introduction to Mandar and Gaurav. Both are award winners. Both have done some groundbreaking work in, in terms of blockchain. And what they're here to do with us today is to simplify it, not to make things complicated for us or give us big explanations. Though they can do that very effortlessly, trust me. But that will sound like Greek. So they are here to tell you what you can do 
with your business models and how you can use people or how can you find partnerships with them because like me they are all about the small the medium and the micro entrepreneurs so mandar and gaurav will take you through the whole blockchain and what you can do with it and why is it absolutely an urgency today to get onto this platform if you want a global advantage thank you very much for this time it's a great great honor to be hosting two of india's very best blockchain experts who are doing some groundbreaking work whether it's in agro tourism in logistics in entertainment in uh, nft in the creative economy space thank you very much for joining us and giving us this time uh, thank you ma'am uh, good morning good afternoon good evening everyone as applicable uh, thank you sonia ma'am for a very overwhelming introduction and a very insightful uh, information into the evolution of technology in our in our current space uh, before introducing ourselves blockchain as a technology we have been hearing about it for a lot of time uh, it could be summed up in a quote by oren harari the light did not come from the continuous improvement of the candles multiple technologies have been invented and and are keep getting invented on on an everyday basis but blockchain is one that is being talked about as big as the internet going back into the 90s and and in the next session our also will make our best efforts to you know throw some light on why it is being said whatever is being said about myself uh, i am mandar dradi and i have been a part of emertech innovations since the past 2 years i work as a chief operating officer and because blockchain is as a wonderful crossroads of technology and impact uh, uh we are working we are fortunate to be working in this field and taking things uh, forward uh, i have done my engineering followed by my mba from faculty of management studies university of delhi i have a digital banking and business development experience with city franchisee uh, across the digital marketing markets and uh, retail division and within emertech innovations i handle product development operations and business development uh, i'll let gorov take over and explain uh, explain about us about himself and about why blockchain promises to be an indeed uh, a realm transact transcending technology over to you gorav <coughs> hello uh, hello uh, hello, uh, hello, uh, hello sorry for the echo speaker sorry for the echo uh, first of all <coughs> thanks to sonia ma'am for and, and the entire organizers of rise world summit for giving this wonderful opportunity uh, without further ado then i want to directly delve into the uh, subject matter because i do realize that uh, there is a certain level of excitement sometimes cynicism or skepticism but love it or hate it you, you can't ignore it that's where uh, blockchain stands today so i'm just going to uh, share my screen with your kind permission so uh, first of all uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity and uh, so just to introduce ourselves so i am gaurav and along with me mandar uh, the you are getting an echo because we are sitting in the same room we are just on the opposite uh, opposite ends of the couch so uh, to briefly introduce so we are both uh, computer science engineers and we have both done mba as well and uh, i've done it from i am lucknow mandar has done from fms and over the course of of time uh, we have uh, you know worked in overlapping places have had intersecting uh, phenomena in our career but finally then we decided to merge our professional and friendship lives together and you know focus upon emertech i'll get to the story of emertech uh, very soon so as the, the quote that mandar had explained that blockchain is about directly inventing electric bulbs and it's very less very uh, but there is an element of improvement of candles which we'll talk about when it comes to the industry part so for those who are interest, interested into the industrial applications where blockchain focuses upon cost reduction and faster turnaround times so it's the like whole spectrum of flavors available for you depending upon how radical you want to be that because blockchain is like like a menu card it's like uh, a set of attributes that depending upon your appetite you should be able to uh, devise a better solution so that is the whole story of farmers also so when me and mandar began interacting with farmers in 2019 it was india's largest group of farmer collective sayadri farms now they are going for an ipo they are that much large so after they understood what blockchain is after we were gave a workshop in marathi for around 2 days it was they who gave us an entire 
overview of uh, what could be done in traceability, which we'll cover very briefly during the course of our presentation so that you get the gist of it. Um, and any tech, so I'll just begin over here. So Melvin Kranzberg had laid out some laws of technology, but you need to be cognizant of only the first and the last one for the sake of this particular technology, you could say. That technology is neither good nor bad, but another important point is that it's not neutral either. It is always going to take sides. Chat GPT is going to take sides of someone. Uh, your CRISPR genetic mutation uh, editing machine is going to take sides of someone. It is always going to benefit some and not benefit others. So that neutrality part is missing. But can we actually, if we are knowledgeable about this particular aspect of technology, can we use it or leverage it in a more equitable manner? And the last one, technology is a very human activity. And the whole history of technology is about human errors as well as the divine element which resides in all of us as humans. So it, it's always that dual, the dual nature that implements itself or rather presents itself in the technology itself. And that there's no other better way to explain it rather than, uh, than uh, instead of nuclear energy. So we discovered that atoms have tremendous amount of energy in them with e is equal to mc square. In 1905, after that, we realized that, wait a minute, we can actually split an atom or we can combine item, atoms. So nuclear energy was discovered in 1934. Now, the first application, you could say, one of the first applications was to directly kill hundreds of thousands of people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in seconds. And six years later, we humanity again figured out that, wait a minute, the same energy could be leveraged for clean energy. So the nuclear energy, how it is used, when it is used, it's completely applicable. It's completely dependent upon people like you and me. If we are not uh, phobic about technology, if we are not resistant about uh, resistant when it comes to our immersion into the technological concepts, and we are confident enough to understand it and pull the technology in order to get in order to make it work for our domains, those are the real game changers, and uh, that is what. We also seek to be in partnership with all of you. So how it just began, the blockchain, just to cover some interesting bit of history. So blockchain is a type of linked list, but not exactly linked list. And as a technology, it is around four decades old. As a concept, it is around <coughs> three decades old. But the word itself came in 2008. So this is the paper in which the word block, blockchain was used for the first time. In fact, block and chain were separate words. It is after the other people. Uh, who were kind of uh, combined into a single word and its first application was of course as you all know was to figure out whether we could have a bitcoin a global currency now here the magical words is actually peer to peer okay, if you can have value transfer in a peer to peer way then what are the radical transformative revenue models that could be devised for all other domains so that kind of worms opened up later but it began through this and we just um, just to be aware of the whole history then in 2012 this particular statement was made that if you forget bitcoin if you forget crypto if you keep that entire portion aside but if you use the technology for example when internet was used uh, earlier earlier it was only for uh, selling drugs and doing all kind of illegal activities so people said we should not have internet now this is 93 94 and imagine then today internet is going 99 percent good things and one percent are still bad so that's where blockchain might have begun in a very radical way, depending upon your political leanings, how you want to say it. But it has a transformative uh, a potential applicable in multitude of domains. <coughs> For example, uh, what Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum, he realized after looking at Bitcoin was, he realized that if we can use the same technology, then this is the only technology which is not trying to take away the jobs of the lowermost workers. It is trying to... Uh, it would be it would be wrong to say that it's going to take away jobs of CEOs, but in a way, yes. About aggregator, if you have nothing more than to offer than an aggregator model, then you might have a threat of blockchain. And we will cover a case study also. So just last month we did a corporate workshop for Uber, and the Uber um, upper management just wanted to know what is the threat of blockchain-based applications. So the threat is right there in front of you in the code itself because. Blockchain doesn't put the drivers out of the job like driverless vehicles, but it definitely presents a threat to Uber. And there is a case study for this, which is a live case study in Bangalore, which we'll cover. So that's our team. Uh, we are incubated at IIT Bombay. But when you wanted to expand, we moved to Navi Mumbai. If you are ever in CBD Belapur, 
please give us a shout and we can you can interact with the whole team and see our whole work uh, so personally i've been doing blockchain since past to close to seven years now and uh, the first implementations happened in chhattisgarh where the first blockchain hackathon where uh, we implemented health records land records and direct benefit transfers during the course of these exercises we found out many fake accounts we ended up saving a lot of money for the government and then the world bank funded the project which we'll see also what it was so this is how it began uh, back then i was a senior consultant for pwc but then the whole idea was that when me mandar and our team was discussing when back when we were just friends can we use blockchain also into the um and so and then social impact sector or private sector or just working independently as an implementer not as a consultant and that is the birth of emerging innovations which is a startup so uh, but back then so i was heading the world bank project also and because it was one of the f- rarest use cases of uh, an emerging technology been directly implemented for e governance i was invited by the uk prime minister and my work has also been covered in a in a small uh, youtube documentary by british council and just a small recognition part of the work that we've been doing since then after pwc when we found emerging innovations we mandar and together so we began primary working in agriculture and just last year we were awarded the best agri tech company in terms of technology one of our projects which we'll go into detail later was also showcased by mr nitin gadkari uh, and blockchain being a more of a mass technology uh, we have been trying to talk about blockchain in newspaper columns youtube channels Uh, books so the first marathi book to talk on blockchain came out and it was uh, a regional best seller as well it got a lot of recognition uh, one of the corporate workshops we had the f- f- good fortune of also sharing it with mr gautam adani sir and we have signed an mou with adani group to test the blockchain's impact for sustainability the startup has won multiple awards uh, first prize in dubai switzerland there's also a popular web series by the name of b rozgar which is based on our startup story Uh, it has close to 2 million views so just because you have to kind of make it as a part of a pop culture the more and more esoteric you make blockchain the more and more this service you will do to it for example today the budget was launched but it did not talk much about blockchain why because the mass um, understanding of blockchain has to penetrate further i am also one of the three indians who is a dalai lama fellow and uh, in this i had the good fortune of explaining blockchain to the dalai lama in 2019 I invited him over to my hometown in Aurangabad uh, around uh, 2019 November where we just uh, invited got him on the stage and saved some of his quotations on a blockchain platform so that got a lot of uh, you know attention because the Dalai Lama is endorsing a technology so that was one thing uh, last year for the post budget session i was invited to discuss about blockchain by the finance minister on saturday again i am invited where i'll be representing the whole blockchain community and giving inputs and asking questions regarding how the budget is going to handle with blockchain the work has also been ac- academically acknowledged and we've published it in multiple journals some blockchain workshops that the book now we'll again uh, focus upon the main part navad ravi kant uh, with or without blockchain you should definitely follow that person uh, I, i i'm guessing most of you would have heard of him if you are just randomly roaming across any airport you are sure to uh, see a copy of his book the almanac so navin darvikant is one of those people who has a knack for identifying unicorns the at the very moment uh, initially so he is a very early stage in, uh, investor in many blockbuster unicorn companies now the three epochs that you talk about the, the this is your web 1 web 2 web 3 in a different language so the web one was actually entirely about reading in static information presented to you on a website uh, on a simple web page to talk about it in a simple manner back then when we did not have personal desktops we used to go to cyber cafes pay 10 rupees for half an hour and just read static pages that is your web one but then we started interacting with data we started writing data onto the servers as well that is when websites became respon- <coughs> responsive so as to accommodate the smartphones and everything and that is the era which is at the peak right now which is web 2 in which we write the data also to the internet but this entire data is owned by the people who are actually owning it so for example when you say you are going to the internet or you when you are logging in you do not own your home you do not own a place to stand you either go to and start living in gmail's house at a rent or in facebook's house at a rent and as they say that when someone is selling you something for free then you are the product so that is the radical inversion so 
earlier what happened that internet did not do anything for sharing value internet was meant only for sharing for sharing information now the difference between information and value is extreme the a value has to be guarded in such a way that there should be no double spending there should be no double printing there should be perfect accountability throughout so internet was never meant for that internet was meant only for perfect uh, sharing of information but now what you have with the blockchain is that the protocol layer of the internet itself is generating value for you which means that your the data <coughs> the data that you are writing on to the blockchain is owned by you the data which is in any case eligible for monetization it is all it was monetized earlier because it was owned by someone else but today there is actually a way for you to own your data and then monetize it for yourself so that is the internet based on blockchain we'll just briefly talk about the definition so that you know uh, what happens is in order for experts to flaunt their expertise it becomes very necessary to talk about jargon and uh, one of the jargons that you will hear from many blockchain people is that no i don't call it blockchain i call it decentralized distributed ledger nothing wrong in that but we just have to kind of dissect it further so it just means decentralized means that there is no single control of power but again this is not applicable to all blockchains there are specific blockchains for example the one by jp morgan or the one by sbi or the one that rbi would have for running its central bank digital currency which would completely be centralized so then the alternative name for blockchain as a decentralized distributed ledger might not always hold true distributed is very easy it just means being <coughs> present in multiple physical places at the same time so that's distributed for you and another way to understand is through token economics but we'll take that away uh, understanding through the examples as we go ahead it just simply means that in many of the models that you will have there are two kinds of tokens that, that are out there if someone is asking you to invest in, in some kind of a cash token then you should be simply asking them is this just another bitcoin but if your token if there's a token which actually solves a purpose which actually has a utility then that is not just even uh, legal but that is also supported in a, in a way and when we will see one of those examples going ahead because what you are doing is you are inverting the uh, company's journey by not going for ipo later on after 10 years but you are going for an ito an initial token offering from the day one itself and these are the tokens which carry the utility information which actually generate value for example imagine uh, a tiktok application in a tiktok application your data is monetized by tiktok and tiktok earns money what if it was entirely based on tokens and there is an, a web3 application for that called chingari for which salman khan is the brand ambassador over that what happens you are given tokens the moment that you are doing any uh, kind of activity which increases the utility for example posting videos the moment you are posting videos you will be given tokens and the value of the tokens is subject to increase depending upon the app's popularity so if the app is getting popular then without me asking for separate esops from the company or separate money or separate anything it's like i'm holding equity from the day one itself and i'll get paid accordingly so that is the whole token uh, portion and then why it is supposed to change the world why people claim about it so we'll just cover that because as uh, ma'am also said in the beginning that web3 changes the way internet works internet not just for sharing information but also for transferring <coughs> value but also for generating and transferring value and uh, the second part is it is going to destroy the revenue models of uber airbnb ola facebook youtube instagram because the aggregators model if some additional service is not provided on top of it then it might just flop so that is the whole thing and the third is governments are very heavily going towards blockchain technology in fact we were still supplied for two tenders that we are just waiting from indian states which we'll also cover after that the sustainability initiatives whether it is carbon credits esg across the world are either piloting or already migrating to blockchain yeah just a second uh, hello thanks uh, gorov for uh, insights into various trends uh, talking about blockchain market trends, uh, Gartner report estimates that blockchain will be a $3.1 trillion industry in the next seven years. Uh, out of these $3.1 million trillion, 40% should belong to cryptos and tokens and the finance part of it, which is about $1.2 trillion. There is still a huge $1.8 trillion 
that is not a part of cryptos and tokens or currencies but has significant industrial applications small to big the various industries are in front of you they are sorted they are not sorted in any order and there's a reason why they are not sorted the natural order of the day should have been we sort industries by their size or by their CAGR and we focus on them as far as industrial applications and utilities being concerned. However, there are two other factors that make this a more complex thing than it seems that is standardization and cooperation. What is standardization? Standardization is if we have created a particular solution or solved a problem for one area or for one of the companies or one geography are the systems and problems standardized enough in other areas so that the r d effort is viable so that the scale so that the solution is scalable and not just standardization the competition is how much cooperation is there amongst the competition for a, for a very very crude example could be coca-cola and pepsico having a, 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 an understanding of sorts that the price of the drink should not be below so and so threshold otherwise they will go into a bleeding war for uh, each other uh, so apart from that uh, the trends that we have seen here is that there's some uh, industries like transports and logistics which will be a huge market which will be the biggest market in the industrial applications followed by healthcare public sector real estate and energy utilities which we are focusing on uh, crypto is losing trust and value, but industrial applications are uh, gaining momentum. Uh, it, it's it's not it's for uh, false to say that crypto has fallen down in value or the technology is whatever we hear about it, but it's just self correcting itself. And when the dot com bubble happened, you know there's so many uh, companies and ideas that came, but the ones that were relevant and actually solved a problem survived. So the basics never changed then, and the basics will not even change uh, now that's why we are opting a service centric approach uh, in the blockchain industry service as a blockchain as a service bas is a model that that we are focusing on uh, web3 has been skyrocketing uh, across the globe and in india bangalore has been the leader uh, there were investments of 1.4 billion dollars in indian web3 companies in the past 12 months the same number was $14 million back in 2019. And even we look deeper, uh, it's not that one or two major players share the bulk of the revenue. The biggest uh, uh, investment has been into Polygon, which has been $200 million. So there is about $1.2 billion that's been shared across small and big Web3 ideas, case studies for uh, one of which we will, we will very, very shortly uh, see. Uh, as far as a McKinsey report is concerned, you know, the, the disintermediation part of blockchain or as Gaurav mentioned, the removal of the middleman part that will happen, but that will take time. It's at a crossroads with government policies, with various currencies and with the Web3 ideas and the, and the aggregator cartel itself. However, the immediate and first and foremost applications are bringing efficiencies into the system, automate, automating payments, uh, uh, reducing supply chain costs, increasing transparencies, increasing authentication, incre reducing counterfeiting and uh, full uh, supply chain traceability and transparency, which have already picked up uh, momentum with uh, even the US military and Pentagon going on and using blockchain as solutions. If you can move on to the next slide. Uh, so the, the solutioning can start at various levels. The first we will need to be smart about solutions. We can't just join the bandwagon and, and uh, you know, try and search for a, we, and be a solution that's in search for a problem. We have to be smart about it. If digitization only solves various problems, then we need not insert blockchain into it for the sake of it. Uh, uh, because there are, because we need to carefully look at a system and see, does blockchain really add any value? And if it does, we can move on to the next level and create some smart products that are scalable and standardized uh, and smart supply chains. This is one area as we reiterate it, that we can integrate and automate various systems. Even some of the best players in the industry like uh, like Mars, like IDC, they have certain problems with regards to supply chain. There is always scope for improvement, if not higher revenue, then lower costs. Uh, 
in inward as well as outward visibility and so on and uh, so forth. And once we standardize this whole process of going across domains, going across solutions and scaling the solutions, we are really creating an assembly line of uh, solutions and processes that it becomes uh, easy to scalable. And, and ultimately, we are looking out at a licensing model of all the solutions that uh, we can deliver. Uh, over to you, Gaurav. Yeah. Thank you, Vandar. So when we talk about Industry 4.0, just uh, to put it in a very simple way, the three major technologies who are supposed to change it, just look at it as a human being. A human being has senses for like touch, smell, sight, and <coughs> uh, balance, and so on. So your senses are actually your IoT sensors. Now, the information that I'm capturing, if it is not stored in an immutable or in a perfect manner, then I might there's no, then there's no point in actually storing information. So that's where blockchain comes into the picture. And the analysis or the insights that will be generated based upon securely collected information and immutably stored information that will give me insights which are much more closer to reality so the combination of iot blockchain and ai is supposed to change uh, the industry 4.0 in that particular manner now i'll briefly talk about the work that we've been doing so we as mandar said that uh, supply chain is one of the largest use cases of blockchain and just some, uh, you know, the quote from the CEO of IBM it's, uh, himself, primarily talking about how entire supply chains could be radically altered and transformed. We'll begin with a very small example. So in India, you have small land holding farmers who are continuously exploited. They don't get anything in return. And after every generation, because of hereditary, the small land holding size becomes even smaller. Now, the only way that these farmers would have a future as per a certain report that came in 2009 was that they should come together and start working as proper companies so like a farmer producer company is a new type of entity some of you must have heard of it so farmer producer company a company is like your ngo or a private limited company or a cooperative it's a separate entity in which only farmers can be the shareholders so that's where we decided to focus currently there are 10,000 farmer producer companies in india we are working with India's largest farmer producer company of around 18,000 farmers. So what was the purpose of actually digitalizing the whole chain? So first we built a spinal cord, which is the Agrotrust blockchain platform. And the whole purpose of this spinal cord, rather than boasting about a product that this is a product come and on board and voila, you will have all the magic. We focused upon a service centric approach, which is directed towards a mission. What is the mission? The mission is to connect the farmers with the consumers. While doing this, of course, we cannot onboard a farmer individually or consumers individually on the blockchain platform. So their touch points will be the farmer producer company itself acting as a client and then integrations or directly supplying modules to the endpoint, which could be a food delivery app or even a retail store, a point of sale system over there. Now, on top of that, then you need to play a game of fill in the blanks and then <coughs> digitalize the entire value chain. So wherever there is no digitalization, you provide modules for that or if it is already digitalized then you do integration for example we have done integrations with sap in which we are sending data to and fro from sap to the blockchain and from the blockchain back into sap now the beauty of digitizing an entire crop value chain is that then you can start adding many services on top of it and which is slowly what we are starting to do but first we began by creating this by converting our services into modules which are highly customizable onboarding more and more pharma producer companies. So for two and a half years, we did this project in which we track the produce right from the farmer's field till the end location. And we are printing QR codes on small packets. So 5.2 million such QR codes were printed. And after sc scanning the QR code present on these packets, you are entitled to see three kinds of information. Know your farmer, which includes farmers, de uh, farmer details, plot location, and so on, so on. Know your food in which certification such as whether it is organic or whether it is uh, uh, certified by fair trade or FSSAI are given. And the third and the most important in which it is more about your willpower rather than technology is the financial transparency because the farmer collectives pushed for it. So we were able to actually demonstrate that if you are purchasing grapes for let's say 100 rupees, then out of those 100 rupees, how much is the farmer getting and what is their complete demarcation in terms of financial transparency? We soon realized that we have to move to higher value products in order to sustain the whole technology. See, five, five years later, 10 years later, this might become just a simple norm. Even it's already becoming a norm in Europe in, in some way because traceability is big over there. 
financial transparency may or may not come over but traceability is simply uh, already a part of compliance but in a place like india we, we realize that we have to move to higher value products in order to sustain the whole uh, uh, you know us as a blockchain team so that's when we started focusing upon cotton so we help the registration of a cotton pharma producer company in uh, near our hometown in aurangabad so 137 farmers were picked out of and uh, we procured 180 tons of cotton from them and then we just tracked it along ginning spinning knitting dyeing fab and final fabric partners who are actually willing to sign the opposite of an nda disclosure agreements in which we are directly integrating with their symptoms uh, with their systems or they are actually putting in information into our modules so that at the end so this is our team these are our developers and designers so in the world's first ever project we are able to print qr codes on t-shirts and this is project primarily owned by the farmers themselves by the farmer collective themselves what happens is you can actually go on ru.world and purchase these t-shirts with qr codes right now after you scan the qr codes you are able to demark see the entire value chain of course it is possible only because we are working with a very limited supply chain when it comes to <coughs> when it comes to the entire cotton as a part there we are working with another client altogether who works in certifications from a top down level which is control union this is a bottom up approach towards cotton traceability there is also a top down approach the beauty of a bottom up approach is that you can pinpoint who are the exact cotton farmers whose cotton is actually resulting into your t-shirts this made a lot of global news so some of the news clippings that we have after that then we are uh, currently working with adani green energy limited to just help them track the entire life cycle of the solar panels so that at the end of the life cycle intel intelligent decisions could be made regarding whether a solar panel should be reused recycled or disposed and because an additional information an additional piece of activity is being done to reduce the land disposals then this activity also becomes eligible for carbon credits so that is one project we are doing another project in ideation phase currently is with the world's largest recyclers of plastic gemini in which the challenge is even twofold over here the rack pickers or the waste collectors they do not even have a smartphone with them most in most of the cases so how do you digitize that so first you map the entire value chain of how a garbage is collected then it is processed recycled and then moved on to gemini and then gemini again gives it to let us say uh, textile makers because that is the same plastic which goes into your levi's puma adidas jeans so here the simple trick was that we are just piloting right now in bhivandi region is to hand over id cards with qr code so that gives a sense of uh, belonging and identity to the waste collectors and that qr code is then supposed to be scanned by the next person in the value chain which is a small scrap dealer so that the kyc details encoded within the qr code are also captured and you have a complete mapping of the work that they are doing which is again visible to gemini similarly currently uh, so carbon credits is not a new thing uh, we have been hearing about carbon credits since almost two decades now but currently now there is a push for carbon credits to move towards blockchain why because the project at which those carbon credits were generated and then they must be traded at least 100 times and then finally the offsetting happens in all of that if there is a traceability of which carbon credit is actually associated with which project it could help to better have uh, auditing rules in place or whether we are not doing double offsetting of the same carbon credit again and again so that's where uh, the european commission himself uh, themselves had said that for carbon credits blockchain becomes in indispensable Uh, for entertainment i'll just uh, move on to let uh, let mandar take over yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks gaurav uh, we have also launched an entertainment nft platform uh, metawood.life just a quick introduction about what an nft is an nft is a non fungible token uh, meaning of it if if you have a 10 rupee coin and it, it, the 10 rupee coin the note or the steel does not represent anything Uh, even the note mentions mai i promise that i will give the dealer 10 rupees mai vaada karta hu mai grahak ko 10 rupaya dunga sir it's it's written on a 10 rupee note in india so then what is the note the note is an accepted version of barter that we can call it a token a fungible token would be a 10 rupee note and a 10 rupee coin or 10 10 rupee notes and a 100 rupee note being exchangeable or a 100 rupee note versus 100 rupees in your bank balance that in in a upi or a paytm account those are fungible tokens non fungible token is something that is unique in its own 
it cannot be the same as the next token so th there was this trend upstarting trend in the west and india soon followed suit about nfts especially in the areas of art and entertainment we have stories about how people became a uh, uh, hundred million uh, dollar art creator just by selling his uh, nfts of five series or days he was an artist who daily created a, a drawing or a digital art or a physical art for five zero three zero days that's about 14 years he never missed it so what was bought a piece of people was bought and why did be people became so famous it could be because he never missed a day it was more for the consistency than for the art that was just to give you one of the examples of how an nfts operate and how do artists make money out of it we are tied up with one such guinness world record artist uh, mr ravi soni from uh, udaipur who has the guinness world record for world's largest drawing it measures a hooping 7000 square feet or the size of a basketball court now what's a tnft a tnft is a tangible non-fungible nft a non-fungible token is a digital ownership of a digital asset that's saved and stored on blockchain that has been attested by the owner or creator of the physical art and that is a digital asset digital being the operative word a tnft is a tangible nft that means along with owning the digital asset rights to that particular piece of art or creation you also own the actual piece of art that is you also have a tangible benefit in with with you so we have this drawing that's in tnft that will be going live as an auction on our on our platform it is waiting for the right moment to get started with the base price of this uh, tnft would be half a million dollars and how do uh, the artists uh, uh, earn out of it majority of the earnings 80 percent go to the artist and 20 percent or so is the platform uh, facilitation fee uh, we can move to the various states and uh, public sector policies and Gaurav will take us through that yeah so um let me just briefly talk about how because many of us would be also having intersect intersecting works with the government itself so just to give an example of how governments in this case maharashtra was the uh, case in which we had presented so public sector is, is going to become the largest implementers of blockchain after web3 in how so health records is a domain which so you must have heard about aims being hacked and the people who hacked it asking for ransom ransom of 200 crores in bitcoin so that actually happened just google if you haven't heard of it all of this could have been avoided if they had just uh, stored their health records on blockchain in fact uh, health records if they are stored on blockchain could also be ethically monetized by giving it to the insurance as well as of course providing better diagnostic care to the citizens themselves ayushman bharat digital mission launched by the pm modi is also is already uh, engaging with different blockchain companies across the world to figure out whether this could happen in india then direct benefit transfers is any government scheme in which the government directly speaks with the citizen called G2C. So anything which is G2C over there blockchain becomes necessary in order to have the transparency in terms of the usage and the dispersal of the funds. Land records on blockchain is, not, is one of the most classic use cases and Indian government is already moving towards it. Just four years ago, the principal secretary of Andhra, Mr. Uh, Jay, uh, Jairam Ramesh had invited me to launch uh, the Amravati as a blockchain district. So over there, every piece of land, the land record would be stored on blockchain so as to minimize the amount of allegations and con conflicts that keep on happening during land mutations. There has been a tender which we have applied for, which we will cover for police and CID management well, so that you should know what is exactly police and CID looking for it. To, in brief, Maharashtra police is going to store your FIRs on blockchain so that they are not tampered with later. Assam CID has released a uh, tender, basically an RFP, uh, asking for uh, solutions in which the entire evidence management from the scene of crime till the entire chain of custody is covered for, till jury is covered on is protected through blockchain so that there is no tampering that happens. There are three states in India who have altered or rather modified their state energy policies, renewable energy policies to add the word blockchain into it so that P2P could be allowed. P2P simply means that any additional energy that you am generating 
on my through my solar panels today i have to sell it compulsorily to the grid tomorrow i could simply have a mobile application in which the smart meter is enabling me to sell my excess electricity in a bidding way to my neighbors so that's one after that then anything where government contracts are concerned so you must have heard about the famous uh, incidents that keep on happening right so that um, as there is a mysterious fire which breaks out in a government office which has certain confidential files and now the files are lost which is many a times a common occurrence you can't do that on blockchain there is no building to burn there is no file to uh, go missing over here in fact in estonia even the speeches of president and prime ministers are stored on blockchain estonia is one of the countries which led the whole in adoption of blockchain first currently uh, so indian government is extremely positive for blockchain because it's look at the four policies niti ayog in 2018 came up with a document to talk about blockchain strategy based on which government of tamil nadu in october 2020 came out with the state blockchain policy signed by the chief minister directly and using that as a reference just 6 7 months ago uh, the center through the ministry of electronics and it department came up with national strategy on blockchain to basically direct all the government as well as the private sectors to start adopting blockchain as much as possible telangana has recently launched a web3 regulatory sandbox so which basically means that they are going to have a incubation funded by the state for both the public as well as the private use cases so that is one of the most radical uh, uh, innovations of uh, or rather in, the most radical center of excellence that you could imagine across all the different blockchain implementations in india just to give, and these are all government most of them are at a pilot level just so that you have a understanding and a view of how it is happening throughout you know don't need to go one by one i'll just say that most of them is concerned with health records and land records and agriculture that is the whole scheme now in terms of <coughs> the private uh, uh, sector and not just the where go, or we, rather you could say the overall applications of blockchain in which government plays a very small part we'll cover over there by first talking about how blockchain is changing the whole digital space so the digital space as we spoke about if you if there is a method for you to own your data that you keep on generating as you travel across the digital space then that could completely alter the revenue models for the future now how it will happen that will go go through so web3 is the so look at the web2 companies you have facebook whatsapp linkedin all of this have either at least one or two or three startups who are trying to uh, come up with a uh, anti aggregator model to do the same thing and the, the in fact the technical word for this is the content creator economy because here we are focusing upon the person or the entity which creates the content which owns the content rather than the middleman or the producer you could say who exploits the content creator generates maximum value out of it and the audiences are also exploited or the consumers are also exploited on one end and on the other end also your content creator a classic use case is of course cab drivers so the consumers have to pay more during the surge pricing when it goes 2x 3x but that extra surge pricing doesn't go to the driver it just goes to the aggregator company it could be ola uber and so on so that's the one so everything that you can imagine in fact netflix just google later for bitflix and you have an alternate over there now i'll just briefly talk about a simple case study so this is what i had presented uh, to the uber management also so just three young people from bangalore the next time you are in bangalore or if you are already in bangalore just uh, try to use their app drive so what happens is over here the drivers have complete transparency regarding who the customers are the customers similarly have a uh, transparency regarding what are the ratings of the drivers uh, which has been given based on their behavior or riding skills and so on here the change is that the negotiation which used to happen in absence of technology let's say 15 years ago when we used to ask someone hey will you go to a certain area for a certain amount of cash and uh, then there was a negotiation which used to happen which was finalized settled and then you used to go this particular part of negotiation was automated through an algorithm by uber and ola as well as other similar companies so what was introduced is again removed and then you are just allowing that negotiation again to take place so when you are booking a cab you can actually bid at what price do you want to go and if the drivers are feel that satisfied with a certain price then the match making happens and then you can simply go ahead so 
won't go much into detail into this, but that is the whole difference between a Web 2 and a Web 3 business model, uh, as talking about as a case study. Over here, you won't ask money for every commission. Maybe you could just ask for a monthly subscription. The matchmaking, as I said, is automated and algorithmic in case of Ola and Uber. Here it is not. And we don't need to go through all, all the uh, details of the row. But basically, you have to understand that blockchain is more about the philosophy of de decentralization, transparency, fair equity, content creator focus, and uh, ensuring that there are no leakages, disintermediation. So blockchain. So these principles, in fact, are older than blockchain or rather older than technology. In 2018, a paper by United Nations very beautifully said that the beauty of blockchain is that it has opened up questions which were always being asked before, but which were simply uh, ignored because people had given up on them. So blockchain reinvigorates those questions. It brings them back into the picture. So you have to understand that the technology is from that sense. If you just look at blockchain as another way of coding things or storing things, then you might miss out on the larger picture. And being the domain experts that all of you are, you stand at a vantage point to better see even further than any blockchain person that how this particular technology could alter the landscape which you are seeing in front of you. So that is the power of being a domain expert, which all of you are in your respective domains. And blockchain is just a set of attributes which you have to think based upon your intelligence and your experience that how or whether it could be used to change and alter things or not. So when it comes to industry, just to fastly cover, legal industry, as we've said, uh, there's a definite use case. Supply chain you've covered, government, energy, retail, education, in fact, so imagine if your resume is not a single piece of PDF file, but if your your resume is hundreds of NFTs, where one NFT certifies that you have a certain skill because it is given by a certain employer, another NFT certifies that you are really a good and kind helping person because someone has actually uh, loved your volunteering activity. And a collection of all of those NFTs attached to your own in digital avatar, that is the future of uh, your resumes in fact not my idea just go to youtube and search for blockchain education and go for this tedx talk by the dean of the university of bologna italy because that's the whole thing travel and hospitality again as i said the, there are hundreds of things which you could do with nfts and because if your experiences could be given a universal ledger for example i have done skydiving and uh, I, have, I have a certificate which says that i for 12,000 <coughs> that i have done it for 12,000 feet if there was just a universal ledger in which 12,000 feet could be added further and further next time i do it in sri lanka next time i do it in let's say us if all of those are cumulatively added then i have a leaderboard profile which is on at a global level and not with a particular agency so many of those things could be done healthcare we've covered food we have covered and uh, something that Mandara touched upon earlier, I'll just very quickly go through this, how to identify blockchain use cases. Now, these are not yes or no things. These are just guidelines. And we've just kind of uh, built them based on experience. So if the work that you're doing has a need for multiple or databases, maybe you could think of blockchain to, in, to bring in trust. If you just have one single database, but you have multiple people who are writing into the database, then again, there's a case of blockchain. And thirdly, is there absence of trust that do you feel that adding a value of trust could add to your business value? If people trust you as a personality or the brand wholeheartedly with complete faith, then you might not need it, but you might not, you might need it while scaling into different geographies, maybe. Then disintermediation, it's not that all middlemen are bad. Many middlemen do some very important activity. In fact, in agriculture also, some middlemen are absolutely crucial to ensure that the farmer gets the uh, correct information regarding which pesticides to use or which market to sell and so on. So if you really want to remove the middleman, then how are you going to also ensure that the services which also go away from the middleman could be given? Transaction interaction basically means that if your database has entries which all talk with each other, if you have just a database main managing your in simple inventory of unrelated items, you might not need blockchain. And the Oracle problem simply means, uh, it doesn't mean Oracle as a technology. It means Oracle as its original English word, which is that whenever an information is coming from the physical world into the digital world, that bridge could be compromised and that is your Oracle. So if the 
if there is absolutely no way for you to digitalize your information then why do we even then blockchain is not a magic wand that is going to solve the case just well briefly talk about like health records you've gone in detail and why health records on blockchain if you ask then it has already been a part of the norm it's just that health uh, care happens to be a state subject and not a central subject so it is up to the states to begin health records in fact maharashtra government is already creating nfts of health records so they have begun the pilots it has officially begun land records in order to do land records on blockchain i'll give you an example of how i did it in chhattisgarh so first you do a complete mapping of what is the current process what are the pain points within the current process most of these pain points are actually solved by digitalization and integrations with each other so that's what the the second step was after it was achieved the integrations and the different uh, pain points were removed then you add blockchain so just kind of giving you a fast forward view of how we did it in chhattisgarh back then that first you identify what is the right sop which could be sustainable and then you think again of a blockchain because it's, there are points within your value chain which are never going to, going to get digitalized you might just save yourself the trouble of exploring blockchain uh, dbt as i said uh, direct benefit transfers so the way that governments could do it and this is the work that i had presented in the uk parliament is that you can map nearly every government scheme based on triggers like birth death marriage and migration which is mapped against against your characteristics which is your age gender ca caste um, income status and so on so your statistics your characteristics determine which triggers are applicable to you so what this does is it helps for the citizens to get proactive delivery of services for example birth could generate a trigger which could activate these different aid schemes at different points in time but at the same time it it protects your privacy also because in 2017 when supreme court came up with right to privacy it said that not a, a single department should not have the complete view of your entire data which sadly is the case with many state governments today they are in direct violation of the right to privacy because there are government clerks out there in india who can use your aadhar number and see the complete information now the excuse that they give for doing that is that they want to proactively deliver you services so they kind of treat proactive delivery of services and privacy as a case of you can't have your cake and eat it too but blockchain does make it possible and uh, just to briefly talk about the proposal we had given to the cid government so just a, one single slide out of their entire proposal that how the the information collected at the crime scene level itself is captured stored onto the blockchain so that the evidence tampering which is mostly resulting into the real criminals going scot free could be minimized because your evidences are beyond tampering because now they are digitally stored converted into nfts and you can't do much about it and energy p2p so with p2p i'll just let mandar explain how p2p is going to just work briefly yeah so uh, p2p is a person to person power transfer mechanism it involves installation of solar panels let's say you are living in a building a that has solar panels but building b does not have solar panels and the government grid rate is let's say 8 rupees per megawatt of electricity what if building a after consuming all the electricity it needs it has generated still has surplus amount of electricity left with itself it has two options they can either send it sell it to the grid or they can sell it to building b that is person to person energy transfer this we are working on facilitating a system where it is created on blockchain it happens on blockchain and there is total transparency and a ledger of records between various entities transacting electricity between themselves what it however requires is a policy level uh, uh, implementation and uh, permissions from uh, the government uh, like the government of uh, karnataka they are they have enabled uh, peer to peer energy trading uh, through solar uh, rooftops power ledger is another uh, doing another initiative in uh, p2p sharing uh, however as as we mentioned before the standardization would in these cases would be pretty high but it starts with government uh, policy making with people also um, creating electricity in a sustainable way selling electricity and making earnings out of it while the, and the buyers can consume electricity at a cheaper way creating a three way win 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 model yes and agri supply chain is something you've covered earlier also so i'll just go to the next one so i'll end with a very uh, interesting case study of blood diamonds uh, in which 
you have uh, a value generation for the society uh, long exploitative industry getting um, getting kind of uh, cautious in its uh, boldness and in terms of how much exploitation it can keep on doing you have a case study of where sops themselves don't prove to be uh, the sole uh, solution givers and where technology actually ends up uh, being the game changer so that is the blood diamond so to briefly talk about blood diamond many of you must have seen the movie by leonardo dicaprio that's how most of us came to know about the idea in the first place it basically means the diamonds which have been illegally or unethically or mined with complete exploitation using human slavery in the primarily in the congo basin as well as other parts of africa and then selling selling them at a very high premium in the western markets but the idea was that can we actually stop this whole blood diamond industry after an ngo report came out in 1997 exposing the whole domain so in 1998 a protocol was signed called the kimberley protocol in which 83 countries came together including india and they signed a protocol in kimberley saying that we are going to follow certain sops when it comes from diamond mining till right until its polishing cutting and final sale but where SOP, sops itself are enough then in 2004 they conducted a study they realized that the sops aren't changing anything then they decided to digitalize the whole process because then internet and digitalization was the new norm but it is very much possible to actually change the data even if if you are digitalizing the whole thing so the same frauds which were possible on paper became possible on internet also but then would blockchain alone solve this whole thing is blockchain alone capable of solving it so then a lady came forth called lian kim she was already working in the diamond industry since two decades she understood what blockchain could do she made a company called ever ledger ever because diamonds are forever and ledger because it's one of the fancy names for blockchain so ever ledger is the name of the startup or rather a company today and um, they've gone into three rounds of funding already as we speak so what ever ledger does is it uses iot and blockchain together it uses iot to remove the part of human data entry so iot sensors are used to create fingerprints of diamonds by capturing the unique parameters associated with each and every diamond so each and every diamond when you capture a multitude of parameters like its hardness its sharpness it's you do an x ray of it you do a spectroscopy of it you do multiple and when you add a combination of all of these results the combination is unique like a fingerprint and that is what gets stored on blockchain so when the diamond is actually traveling throughout the value chain it becomes very difficult to infuse blood diamonds into it because it has to match the earlier entry or if something is changed that change has to, or if something is changed that change has to happen through authorized people within the value chain so just a sample of the work that has uh, not exactly by ever ledger but the work that they've inspired by another similar company over here you can see that after scanning the qr code present on the diamond all the details uh, the physical details the physical attributes of the diamond along with its entire journey are visible including the identities of the people involved within that journey and another side effect uh, positive side effect of this was uh, when Uh, some people tried to sell stolen diamonds back into the main uh, value chain the mainstream people could just check whether this diamond's fingerprint has already existing in the ledger whether it has been marked as missing or stolen and then you could actually figure out okay these are the stolen diamonds and now uh, lian kemp the founder of ever ledger is using the same use case and migrating to multiple domains and not just sticking with diamond so just to kind of end it uh, wanted to end the session with uh, that note that how a combination of technologies plus domain experience plus some uh, useful process changes help to alter the whole domain so i think with that uh, we would love to uh, just open ourselves to any questions i would love to answer and discuss yeah Uh, Sonia, ma'am, uh, would you like to uh, open the session to question answers? Uh, I open the floor for question answers. If there's anybody who has questions to ask, we are more than welcome. But I think for most, this will be quite overwhelming. So, um, may I ask a few questions which might be of everyone's interest? 
so basically, I just want to do a rough roundup of everything. Um, so there were wonderful, wonderful examples from government examples to peer to peer examples, to social impact examples, you'll have gone through the spectrum of it. One of the key things that I'd love you all to talk about is how it can touch the life of an average, tra average travel entrepreneur, not a government, not a, uh, not a company, not a startup, a small mid size or small sized operator in the travel industry. How can it change? them what can a blockchain if they put themselves on blockchain how can it create a change yeah uh, so we are working in fact uh, with a partner uh, who's my childhood friend called anand bansode so he has tracked all the highest peaks in all the major continents he has gone to everest i think twice and uh, recently he began uh, uh, not recently three years ago he began his own tracking company called 360 degree explorer so uh, we kind of jointly came up with an idea. He pitched that idea to a Silicon Valley accelerator. So he just returned from Silicon Valley. He was there for three months. The idea is basically that if the experiences that are generated during all of these treks, or the if they sometimes they are qualitative, sometimes they are quantitative. For example, skydiving, completely quantitative experiences, which are absolutely necessary because if I want to dive without a instructor and want to do solo diving, then I need to have certain amount of uh, jumps already in my kitty. So a ledger to actually accommodate all of that information for the quantitative data and then NFTs of unique experiences. So for example, right now, uh, one of his teammates, uh, the Mount Kilimanjaro is going to be scaled by the youngest Asian ever. So if those experiences could be converted into NFTs because people want to participate into uh, such uh, such ways. So that NFTs could be used for crowdfunding as well. That NFT could be used as an art gallery separately because then you are actually uh, converting your experiences into assets. There's And the yes. experience being intangible also. Need, NFTs are also intangible, but they're associated with it. So that's one way that we are actually going ahead with it. Apart from that, then you have your entire loyalty program schemes associated with different <coughs> associated with different hotels, uh, trekking companies, travel equipment in which you could have a single token running the whole economy throughout. So that is definitely a, a way to go through it. Yeah. Is there, um, how can someone who is um, an independent travel operator, a solopreneur, or, uh, how can they avail or partner with a company like you? Um, so just like Mr. Anand Bansodi already did. So we are open to uh, multiple forms of engagement and uh, okay. together we can figure out a way. Perfect. So that means you're open to small and medium yeah. class entrepreneurs, uh, sector entrepreneurs coming to you. Okay. Well, that's really heartwarming. Thank you for such an in-depth and informed session for actually demystifying it by telling us use cases. Most times we only get to hear about the technology. We don't get to hear about the use cases. This understanding of use cases is really heartwarming. And it actually, we can draw inspiration and create our own structures with it. Like Gaurav rightly said, we are the keepers of our own future. And how we can drive this with technology now that we have the know-how is our own to do. Thank you very much to Rise Global. Thank you very much to you and thank you you for me because I are, and the unknown planet believe that small and medium entrepreneurs are the face of our future and if they are digitized they have the technology the traction and the training in hand sky is the limit so thank you once again for your time um have a nice day everyone thank you for attending all the attendees thank you, thank you very much for your support thanks thank you